Rob, thank you so much for the time to chat with you. This is a joy. Um, I'm, I'm a Scarborough boy, so this film hit deep. Uh, <laughs> um, no, Drop the Needle's great. I, I really appreciate the story. And, and like I said, I, I felt like I could connect to it. And I've driven past the store. I've been in the store. Um, what was it that made you want to tell the story of, uh, well, of Play to Record, or, but also just the, the story in general? Well, I, to be honest with you, I kind of stumbled into the, the, the play to record as a topic. When we started this, uh, myself and my colleague uh, and good friend, Neil Acharya, when we started this project, or my initial attention was uh, to make a project that kind of showcased and focused on my, what I perceive to be my style of filmmaking, my style of storytelling. Um, so when we started it, it was based on that. Uh, talking to Neil, I'm like, you know, what, what can we do this on? What can we we, we do as a, a topic? And he's the one who suggested play the record. Mm. I knew nothing about play the record. I grew up in Kingston, Ontario. I knew nothing about play the record, and um, but I knew there was potential there because I, you know, you, you hear, you know, you recognize sometimes you don't even know how, but you recognize places as being important. And you don't know why. Yeah, I knew play the record was important. I just didn't know why. So I knew. So with that idea of the potential behind the topic. You know, kind of gave it a night thinking about it and then said to Neil, you know what, let's let's pursue this. Let's see what happens, because it, it does sound like there's some serious potential here. You know, I, absolutely. And it is sort of an iconic face in in uh, in Toronto, well, in Toronto and Scarborough. Yeah. But uh, I was wondering from from, you know, your research and from your experiences, what do you what have you learned as the legacy of Eugene and, and played a record? The legacy of Eugene, well, they're kind of both the same, but so somewhat different. The, the legacy of Eugene, and I don't, his legacy continues to this day. That's one thing sure. is that um, he, he's still going strong. He's still on Spadina. I know that the movie, I don't want to get too much into the details of the movie, uh, the ending of the movie, I should say. Right. Um, but he's still going strong. Uh, he's, st he's still going strong today with his passion mm. for the business, for the music. His passion is still going strong to this day. Um, and so for me, it was like, you know, learning about Eugene and learning about, uh, his store, uh, and, and learning about that passion that he has, not just for the business, but for the music itself. Before Eugene opened up, played a record in 1990, he moved to Canada and he was going to places like called Star Sound, Carnival Records, Sam's the Record Man and whatnot, but Star right. Sound and, and, and Carnival Records were not just those two stores, but there were some of the, they were played a record before played a record was played a record. Right? Mm. That's where the DJs went to. That's where you got the, the underground music. And Eugene was right there getting that music as well. So his passion for the music has been there the entire time period. And it was really interesting and, and fascinating to kind of see how his passion for the music is what helped to develop this environment of other people coming in and, and having a similar uh, interest and similar, uh, uh, you know, similar thoughts and feelings that Eugene has when it comes to the, the product that they were dealing with. Yeah, it, it seemed like a really uh, like he he's become sort of a central figure, um, and over over the years, um, I I love the idea. At one point, now I know that there's there's talk about the relationship that Play to Record had with all sorts of different avenues. I think the word is hub of an ecosystem. Yes. I was wondering uh, what to you what that means and why that was so important. Well. When it was said during the movie, I think it was said in a little bit of a different, uh, I don't know if this is the exact same context it was used in the movie, but the way I interpret it, the, you know, the idea of being a hub is that you have a store that attracts people that have maybe a, a different like. Some people go into the store that like hip hop. Some people go in the store that like drum and bass. Some people go in the store that like reggae. Some people go in the store to like, uh, you know, house music and all the, 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 the electronic umbrella and all mm. the subgenres behind under the uh, Tronabella. And you have this very kind of tight, uh, uh, long, but tight store where everyone's coming together and super busy and people are talking about music and they're hearing music, but they're also being exposed to, to new things. So this hub is an area where people can uh, share uh, interests and share and ex be exposed to new sounds that they didn't actually go, they didn't initially go into the store uh, you know, it wasn't their purpose when they went into the store. And that's the, also the important thing too about the people that work there. Jason Palmer, for example, was one of the most knowledgeable per people in the uh, city when it comes to the different music and, and, and genres of music. So having these employees there that knew their music and was able to expose different sounds. So you go into the store with something completely different than you thought you're going into, but you, you love it and you, you, you know, 
uh, you've been exposed to it now. So that was the important thing about that hub is just being exposed to new sounds and new ideas. Yeah, I, abs absolutely. Uh, one of the things I love that the film talks about, and, and this is just me showing my age, uh, there's a certain magic to the mixtape era. Um, and and I, I thought that was so fascinating because you show both both the celebration of it and sort of the the problems that came with it at, at, in the same time. So I guess my, my question for you is, is um, the, the mixtape, I was wondering for you, what is, what is the magic of the mixtape and, and why did it cause so many problems? The problems it caused was that as the business increased from mixtape sales, mm. people would see that and say they want to get a piece of that action. And they had the power and the ability to ensure to to knock out any competition. That was the uh, problem with the mixtapes, uh, or what, what ended up happening with the mixtapes. At least that's my interpretation. I wasn't there; I'm not an expert. Uh, from what I gathered, that's kind mm. of what happened. The power of the mixtape, though, it's a little hard to, to answer that one. I, it's because it's funny. I remember when I was growing up, and I had a friend of mine. It was Neil Neil's cousin, actually, uh, uh, and he should share it. was a DJ on his own. He, had, he made a mixtape, a mix CD, and he brought it to school one time. And I remember I was, I was listening to it and I was exposed to some songs like for the first time, uh, like Traveling Man by Most Def and DJ Hondo is an example. And these songs stuck, This the songs I heard stuck with me. And I don't, I can't put my finger on why. Like the mixtapes, it was about exposing new sounds, about exposing new songs, right? Mm. Uh, and hearing how people mix the songs and whatnot. Um, but there was something about compilations that same with rap essentials, there's something about compilations that kind of have a way to, to stick with you a little bit longer. And I really don't know why, to be honest with you, I don't, <laughs> I don't know why that is. Uh, but I do know what happens. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's interesting. We, and I remember there was that era too, and this, this isn't from the film, but I just remember this era so vividly that, that, you know, the, the, the record companies tried to capitalize on that. You know, you were, you were getting these, you know, these, what was it? Oh, big shiny tunes and, and all this stuff as well. And it was, it was essentially the same idea, but it, there, it, it's not the same thing. It's not, maybe it's not as personal. I don't, I don't know what it is, but it didn't feel like the same thing. I, I think that the, some of them might have to do with the packaging and how you buy it too. I mean, there's something special about kind of getting something that's like really, really underground. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a unique value that comes with that. So if you're going and seeing this, uh, you know, uh, the, the standard label, there's like about a hundred copies of the standard label and you know that everyone's kind of getting that same exact same uh, thing. But then if you're the one person who knows there's only like maybe 50 other people that got that, that DJX mixtape or, uh, you know, the electronic umbrella, like the uh, uh, drone bass, there was so many great uh, people making electronic mixtapes and mix uh, and, and drone bass mixtapes knowing that there's not many copies of that out there and that it is a little bit more underground it's a little bit more rough around the edges in terms of packaging and maybe even how it sounds a little bit uh, i think that's actually there's an appeal to that to be mm. honest with you I've, I've seen a lot of movies in the past i'll go to the movies for a second you look at a movie like clerks right mm. now if i watched that again recently clerks really isn't that good of a movie like the the acting is kind of garbage <laughs> i mean there's some <laughs> okay acting kind of garbage it's not like a lot of good stuff uh, the filmmaking is, is really, really rough around the edges, yet I love that movie. Yeah. So, and a lot of people love that movie, right? So uh, I think there's maybe sometimes there's, appealing, there's an appeal to things that are, have a little bit of roughness around the edges and they're not super polished. And perhaps the mixtapes kind of fall in that line. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. I hadn't, uh, yeah, what a great comparison. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, you know, with, with what you're, you know, with what you're learned and, and whatnot, their relationship with TV. You talked a little bit about much music. Um, and, and Rhapsody is such a, a, you know, such an iconic show, or at least, you know, I, this generation has never heard of it. But I mean, it was, it was for my generation growing up. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering what, what relationship you found uh, between that and, and the, and played a record, you know, the, the on the ground did like did that change things for them because again you know okay this is a terrible reference when in this conversation but video killed the radio star they used to say that you know this was that that was before but was the was the relationship between uh much music and 
record stores like played a record was it a healthy one or or were there was there tension oh no i i, I mean listen i'm not I, I can't say for sure um but from what i gather from what i know and seen uh, i was it was very healthy mm. uh, because uh rap city and, and extend the mix and um electric circus they were doing you know soul in the city before that that was before played record opened but uh, they were doing the uh, the promos and uh, Play to Record was doing the sales. That's how I first heard about Play to Record was watching Extend a Mix and seeing uh, Dave, DJ Dave Campbell. They would have DJ uh, Dave, DC's picks and they would show some of the records that were going out at that time period, the singles that were going out at that time period. And it would say sponsored by Play to Record. That's how I heard about mm -hmm. Play to Record uh, was was through that, that relationship. So I think that the relationship between the two must have been a, a good one. Um, you know, from, from what I gather and, and, you know, played around, I think with much music, when much, much music did, uh, was able to bring music locally and bring it nationally. And when you do that, that increases the audience or people that want to buy the records. And if you are in a small town, like in say Kingston, for example, which isn't small, but you know, you can't mm. always get everything you want out of Kingston. Well, what do you got to do? I just saw this Citizen Kane music video. I really want that song. I can't get it in Kingston. I gotta go drive the three hours. That's what people did. This is what my friend uh, Nisha Cherry did. Like, go drive down the play to record, get the records, bring them home. And people were doing that in Ontario. The people were doing that in Halifax. Scratch Bassett was doing that. People were doing that uh, uh, in the West Coast, where people would be shipping it to the West Coast from. Eugene would be shipping it to the West Coast. So I think much music took the music a lot nationally, but in turn, the association with play to record also helped take play the record to a little bit of a uh, take the play, play the record nationally as well mm, mm, yeah um yeah one of the things i was interested to this as well you you do talk about this a little bit in the film um the transition to the digital age mm. i was wondering if you think we've lost anything because there, there's this beautiful sense that uh, even for you know whether it you know the like play to record is this fascinating community. Like every, everybody is there, you know, Thursday's record day. Um, there, you know, all the, all the big name DJs are there. People sort of knew each other. They walked, I think at one point they said, it's like, like Norm from cheers. You walk in, everybody knows who you are, which is a fascinating reference. Um, I was wondering I if people you get that one. I love cheers. I hope people forget <laughs> that reference. You know, that one's the one I'm like, that might go over people's heads, but I like, I got I like it. that reference too. So I, know, I, I love cheers. So yeah, <laughs> it was a great comment. Yeah. Uh, do you think we've lost anything in the digital age and, and how have we made it made up for that or have we? Well, we absolutely have lost something in the digital age. And um, I know, I, you know, to be honest with you, like, I don't want people to experience it. Uh, and that's what I hope to do in the movie. That's kind of, uh, you know, where, uh, you know, some of the stuff that I'm uh, doing in the movie. But to answer your question, we have absolutely lost some things, but, you know, we have also gained things too. I'm not a DJ and I'm not going to even pretend to be even close to being a DJ. So I'm kind of basing what I've been seeing and, and sort of uh, hearing. Uh, and what I see in here is a lot of excitement right now, for example, over this new version of Serato, where now DJs have this ability to, uh, because they, I'm not an expert, like they take stems and use stems and all this kind of stuff and they can manipulate the songs to a much greater degree than they ever could beforehand. And the excitement that they have over being able to, to incorporate, uh, you know, the excitement they're able to, to bring on the from a creative perspective, um, you know, there's just a lot of excitement over this. So he, yes, we absolutely lost a lot of things with the transition from digital, but I think that there is the things that people did gain as well. So, you know, it's just one of those things, right? It's like, you know, it's, it's just evolution and, and things happen, right? So what I hope, to, my hope is that with play to record, you're never going to have what it was before. Now it's not going to happen anymore. Like, like it was then, but let's, that evolve as well like what's the next phase like i don't know i i i my story kind of goes up to 2016 that's where my story ends essentially right we interviewed him in 20 uh you know 2021 or whatever it was but my story kind of ends in 2016 so what's the next step what's the next phase what's the evolution of things it won't be like it was there but it could be something else now like and, and I, I hope that it's something that that is that can be just as special as important just not the exact same yeah, that's an interesting point. Like, I mean, this in some ways, just the very existence of Play to Record still is dinosaur is 
too dramatic a word, but it is it is a, an echo of a of a prior age. So much much music is gone. Yeah, uh, CK, CKLN is gone. Um, Tracks, which was the other big record store, is gone. Right, and Star Sound and Carnival, and there's other record stores out there right now. Of course, like there's other places that kind of popped up beforehand, but having that that one place that kind of is still there. And I know the Young Street store location kind of changed things, like the actual having that physical location where all the memories were had. When that closed in 2016, I think that kind of did hurt. You know, that kind of hurt a little bit. But there was a really great quote in the movie. I don't, I don't mind, even though it happens later in the movie, I don't mind spoiling it, which is that uh, home is where Eugene is, right? Mm. So even though the memories happen in, um, in on Young Street, Eugene is the store. Eugene is playing. Yeah. And so he, him being in Spadina, when you go in there, you're going to see the music. You're going to see Eugene. You're going to see other people that you could talk to. And so my hope is that unlike other places that, didn't have that chance to evolve into the next phase, the next step to continue going forward. Play to record has that ability to, to evolve into the next phase so that it can continue on. Cause there is something comforting with having, you know, play to record still there today. It's a very comforting feeling for a lot of people. And I think that, uh, you know, that's what you kind of experience in the movie. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. Home is where Eugene is, is such a great line to sum up the film. David Ahmad. David Ahmad was, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll hear who says it in the movie, but that's uh, David Ahmad said that one. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a great way to sum it up because he really is sort of the soul of that, of that place. And, you know, talk about evolution, like that place has evolved as well over time. And, and even his uh, his relationship with you know trying to help new local artists and and whatnot, it's it's incredible. It's it's phenomenal. Yeah, now that's the big thing. But I think one of his when he talked about his legacy, which again is I don't think it's over, but one of his legacies is the contribution when during a time period when uh, artists there was no internet, right? There was uh, there was very limited access to getting your music out there. There was a very limited access to money to make your music. And Eugene was a place that gave both. Eugene offered a, a, a spot. Uh, other record stores did too, but I think that Eugene, you know, from what I gather, right, Eugene was a place that made it a little bit more easier for someone to come on, come in and say, hey, listen, I got this record. I really want to, like, you know, get it out there. Will you help me? And Eugene was very much open to helping them out. He built a studio uh, in his basement and a label called Stephen Bigga where it gave people access to equipment at, at rates that might have been a little bit more affordable than they would have experienced elsewhere. So he contributed to the art of the city uh, a great deal uh, during that time period and, and beyond, but uh, certainly during that time period when you didn't have the help that maybe the internet provides. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Rob, thank you so much for chatting with me. I really do appreciate it. Uh, the film is a lot of fun. It's in, and like I said, I, I, for me, it just shows my age because I'm like, oh, I remember these things. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But, but no, I think... be like how it is for everyone. Everyone does right. kind of, uh, you won't be the only one feeling that. <laughs> Although you were in uh, Scarborough, so, uh, you must have held, uh, saw the, um, uh, he had the Scarborough location yeah. for a little while. Right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm down at Spadina quite a bit as well. So I see the old one as well. Um, it, it really is an amazing story and, and a, a iconic location about, and, and help give people a voice in our city. So I really am thankful for that. Uh, thanks so much for the time to chat, Rob. I really do appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Great. Have a good day. You too. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye-bye.